Thanks. It's great to be here. And in fact, most of my introduction was already given by the fantastic talk uh, given by Rizi. Um, so I'm actually going to try to finish my slides. Um, and, <laughs> and if not, I'll just keep talking, I've learned. And nothing will happen. So that's great. They will get mad. OK, OK. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> anyway, so this work was mostly done um, at Qualcomm um, with the following people. Um, there are actually f three first authors on this paper in a permutation invariant order, which is actually quite hard. You have to put them in some order, but it's really a, you know, a linear combination of all the permutations of Rizzi's uh, representation there. So it's uh, Taco Cohen, uh, Marie Swaller, and Varkai Kichanoglu. Um, Taco is now at Qualcomm, and the other two are in Cuba Lab, which is a lab uh, sponsored by Qualcomm. OK, so the thing I want to talk about, um, so this is my physics slide. Um, actually, actually, I do have a PhD in physics, so I could sort of talk a little bit. But I've forgo forgotten almost everything about physics. But um, OK, I, this is at least what I do remember. Um, so in, in physics, you know, you all know you write down your equations in an active or covariant way, basically, which means that um, independent of the observer, it should still be the same equation. You just have some simple transformation law which transforms the equation into sort of an almost equivalent equation. At least it looks the same. Um, and this one, um, of course, in Maxwell, uh, by the time, before Maxwell, by the turn of the 20th century, um, magnetism and electricity were two very different things. Um, and then Maxwell found that Lorentz transformations actually transformed like one observer into the other and the electric field became the magnetic field. They're all basically the same thing, which is really the power of, of symmetry and thinking about symmetries. Um, it unifies uh, lots of sort of things that look different. Um, and the same thing, of course, happened with uh, Einstein uh, for general relativity. Um, he equated basically um, acceleration with gravity, also a form of symmetry. And again, you know, things unified into one beautiful theory. So now that's what we want to do, too, in uh, deep learning. Oh, yeah, and here's uh, one other. I won't elaborate on this, but this is the standard model. And also the standard model is, of course, governed by you know, symmetry groups, you know, in this case, SU3, U1, and SU2. And this is all of physics, basically, um, except for gravity, I guess, um, in a bunch of particles. And, and actually, the nice thing is that the, um, so the, 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 there's also gauge fields. And this is the topic of today's talk. Uh, and gauge fields are sort of associated with local sort of symmetries. Um, and they are the carriers of the force. Um, in, uh, in, yeah, in, in physics, in the standard model. OK, um, so back to deep learning then. Um, so in deep learning, and uh, you know, I will go fast because Rizzi already you know, talked about all of that. Um, so this is a very old you know, movie, actually, by Jan McCann. And he shows that you know, so this is a neural net. And here you see all these feature maps uh, of a neural net. Um, and, you sh and, and clearly, if you, if you then translate the, the input, then you, and you look at the feature maps, they beautifully translate as well. So that's what we call uh, equivariance. Um, but then if you rotate them, you know, he already noted that, you know, of course, the actual responses of the neurons actually change, right? And so it's not equivariant under rotations. And uh, so, so there's a lot of data that is at least rotationally symmetric. Um, you want to get the same answer whether the input data is rotated, yes or no. Um, and so you would want to maybe also build rotation symmetries into, you know, convolutional neural networks. And here's a somewhat nicer visualization of this. This is done by um, uh, Daniel Worrell, um, now at my lab, but he did this work uh, while back at Cambridge, I think. Um, and uh, so here, you know, you take an input image and you look at the uh, sort of the filter responses, and then you stabilize the filter responses, basically by taking a camera and rotating the camera with the input image and then looking what the screen says, right? And then what you see here, he's replicated. And for a normal neural net, this thing is not stable. It, it changes, right? Um, the filter responses change. And he, you know, had a neural net called harmonic networks, uh, which um, already, you know, were equivariant under rotations, and you see that the, that the uh, responses or the activations of the neurons are then totally stabilized. OK, so then, um, oh, that's uh, unfortunate, but OK, that's a little bug. Um, but let's, let's look at what equivariance means in a somewhat more mathematical way. 
Um, so let's take some function f, which in this case is just the tick uh, of activation and uh, map it through a nonlinearity or through a, through a convolution and a nonlinearity to the next layer, basically, of a neural net. Um, so that's going from x to y. It's going one level into a neural net. And then this could be, phi could be like a symmetry transformation, like a rotation or a translation going from x to x prime. So here's an example in pictures. So you shift, you know, the, um, the salamander. Um, and, then, um, and then what you really want for equivariance is, is whether you go first, you filter and then you translate, or you first translate and then filter. That should be the same thing. So it's like a commutative diagram for mathematicians. Um, OK, so let's tell, me, tell you a little bit how you can get equivariance for simple groups by rewriting uh, basically a convolution in a very simple way. Um, so all of this is, was already basically covered by, by Rizzi, but I'll just say it again in different words. Um, so you take a function f, which could be your input image. Um, and I'm going to you know, define this operator ts, which is a shift um, of the image to the right. Um, applied to the function to the image f, right? And so that's you know evaluate if I do t f evaluated at x, that's the same as f evaluated at x minus s. So that's a shift to the right. And then uh, a convolution is basically the following operation: you take your input feature vector f k, where k index is the is the vector index for that feature, and x is the position. Then you take your translation operator, uh, you shift it over s. And the psi is a little filter here. Uh, you have k of those as well. And then you take the, you know, the inner product over, uh, well, you take, you take the inner product over that shifted filter with the input image f, and you also take the inner product over the features k. And that will give you the convolution value at value s, where s is here the translation. Okay, that's simple. That's just rewriting a normal convolution. Now let's do the same thing for or any other group convolution. So now I just define the operator t a bit differently. That's, that's the only change I'm going to make. I'm going to say tr now is, let's say, some operation on x. Let's, let's imagine it's a rotation. So tr of f evaluated at x is the same as f evaluated at r minus 1x. So that rotates the, um, the image around. And then the only thing I'm going to say now is that a convolution is defined as you know, precisely the same thing as here, but now I'm going to replace this translation over S with some group element G, right? It could be a rotation or it could be a translation and a rotation. And then you note that the output is then actually a function of the group G. So the output field, if you want, is like a function of the group G. Oops, of the group G. Okay, so um, sort of operationally for the very simplest, I'm going to only cover really simple examples. So the simplest example is, let's say, you, you take uh, rotations over 90 degrees, right? So that forms a group with four elements. Um, and then um, you basically, so this is a normal convolution where you just shift. And here I have a shift and four rotations. So you see it does a shift here. And then now it rotates, boom, and it's going to go again. But then it stores the result in a different feature map, right? So now I have four feature maps instead of one, and we can call that a capsule if you want. And, and, and sort of Jeff Hinton would call that thing a capsule, basically. OK, so then um, in sort of some uh, sort of a illustration, so here we have uh, sort of an input image. And we have, let's say, two detectors. We have a detector of an eye and a mouth, right? And we have now uh, you know, four of those orientations, right? Because we had the four orientations. We have two detectors and both at four orientations. And then if we, if we run it on this input image, right, it only the first orientation fires, right, and it fires like this. So two red fires here and, and one green firing here. Okay, now I rotate the input image. Now two things happen. The first thing happen, happens is that, you know, I'm actually going to get responses from a different set in a different set of feature maps, right? So it's not, no longer the first set, but it's, it's going to be the second set. So now I've actually cycled you know, one step through the input maps. And also, you know, as you can see here, the, the actual responses inside the map has, have rotated as well. So that's, um, that's a bit, you know, and you can, you know, you can figure out that that's actually an equivariant uh, sort of feature map, uh, sort of uh, filtering operation. Now, 
uh, equivariance uh, has as a special case invariance, right? Um, it's exactly the same, so uh, this is you know identical except for the fact that now this particular operation here is not uh, sort of a, an actual you know uh, sort of matrix or whatever operation. It's just the identity, right? And so Rizzi had exactly the same thing. So we we used to you know. Uh, Thomas has been working on sort of graph convolutions where this is just the identity. You sum over things and it's invariant for graph uh, convolutions. But you know, if you put here a permutation matrix, you get equivariant. And so there's something very analogy, analogous to what's going on. Okay, so why, and I guess this is again reflecting what Rizzi said, so why don't you want um, just invariance? What's wrong with uh, just having invariance all the way? And the problem is you lose the information about relative uh, sort of the, the relative relationship between the neighbors in, in, in your graph. So this would be a perfectly fine input image of a human being, right? But you see that the, you know, all of the relationships between all the parts have been, you know, scrambled, um, but the neural network doesn't care about that because it's, you know, it just detects that there's eyes and noses and mouths and they're all in this image. Um, and it doesn't care about, you know, what their, or, you know, the relative orientation is. Okay, so then, um, so that's, uh, now I'm going to do a little uh, uh, sort of a demo or maybe, uh, you know, your, your, particip your participation is, uh, is, is uh, ne needed here. Um, so now I have like uh, three uh, ch color channels here. So they have an input image and I've sort of separated the three color channels. So the input image is already a three-dimensional vector or, well, th or three-dimensional scalars. Right, it's, it's three numbers for every pixel, and um, so the question to you is: Is this a, is does this constitute a vector? So ev every pixel, let's say this corner pixel here, does that constitute a vector or does that constitute three scalars? Right. So in other words, you have to ask yourself the question: What happens if I rotate the input? It, the question is whether it's a vector or a scalar under rotations. Um, you know, you have to ask yourself the question: What happens when I rotate? So who says it's a three-dimensional vector field? Says it's a scalar field. Press is not responding, and uh, so this is actually three scalar fields because if you if you um, rotate, then a vector by its you know nature should mix these values together, right? If you take a vector, the coordinates of a vector when you rotate it, you're taking linear combinations of those three numbers when you rotate it. Um, in this case, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the vector, the vector is just, okay, yeah, so three scalars, right? So if I take this pixel here, these three pixels, so that, that is a vector. Uh, sorry, it's not a vector, it's three scalars, right? And then the question is if I rotate the input image, do, do these three numbers mix together? And the question, and the answer is no, they just shift around like that. So that's three scalars instead of a vector. A vector would mix these numbers together. Um, so more, okay, so this is sort of written it out. So I have for this is for one pixel or maybe, yeah, for one pixel or maybe you could put all the pixels in the big vector, big, big vector here. Um, and, you know, they just get, it, they transform by just multiplying by one. That means it's a scalar. Um, so now the next one is if I take the spatial derivatives, so ddx and ddy, so here are the two spatial derivatives. And I now sort of look at the full picture, which is, you know, two derivative images per color channel. Then the question is if I rotate in this direction or take the gradient and then rotate, okay, so what type of, you know, is this like a one six dimensional vector or is it maybe six scalars or maybe it's uh, three two dimensional vectors, right? All of these options are possible. Um, and in this case, you know, if I start to rotate, the gradient fields actually, you know, they, they mix together. So the, the, the value of this pixel becomes a linear combination of these two pixels, but the color channels don't mix together. So that basically means that the representation, you know, under which you transform these things, you know, has a little rotation here and a little rotation here and a little internal rotation here. Okay, so, um, so um, what we're going to have to choose is we're going to have to choose uh, for, we're going to get these capsules, which are these sort of, internal vector fields, you know, and by that I mean so an entire uh, feature map is now, you know, one of these 
one of, or a collection of feature maps is this, these apps. And these will internally transform under some representation of the group of choice, right? And this could be any representation um, that I can choose of, but it's some representation of the group, let's say a rotational group, which will mix together the, the elements um, of this particular uh, vector here. And, and I'm gonna have to, and I can in general build up like a whole stack of feature um, maps by thinking about you know these capsules, which which one of them will sort of transform into each other, you know when uh, when I do a, a, a transformation. Okay, so um, what? Okay, so let's first quickly say what is a representation. Um, and now a representation is basically if I have two elements of a group G uh, and H, then if I take you know you know, in group space, if I take their product, I get the new element of the group per definition because it's a group. And then I take some representation row, which could be some matrix, right? That has to be the same as taking the matrix of the, of the element G and multiplying as a matrix with the matrix of the element H. So that's basically what a representation is. Um, and then um, the, the most sort of the general transformation of a vector field looks like this, and I'll explain this in a minute. So a vector field in general transforms like, like the f of x goes to you know, some matrix depending on the element g that I pick. Uh, that multi and, and that's a representation of that group times that vector field f evaluated at g minus one x. So if you do general relativity, for instance, you know, this is exactly the same um, you know, uh, equation you get, and then this is this you know, dx prime dx or something. Okay, how does that work? So here's a vector field, right, f of x. So here's the vector field fg minus one x. So I've, I've rotated it. So that basically means if I take this point here, I'm rotating it to, to here, right? So I just take this field and I rotate it around, right? So that's g minus, f of g minus one x looks like this. Now that's not in general what we think of as a rotated vector field. That's what we think of as a rotated vector field. So we need to do something more in order to actually rotate the vector field, which is exactly rotate the vector at every position, right? And that's where this row of G comes from. Okay, so, um, and before I've talked about like uh, taking a sort of a, a group like a rotations and cutting it into, into like 90 degree, or discretize it, discretizing it into 90 degree rotations. Right, and then, um, and then what, what you know, you, you, the representation that you'll have is a particular permutation um, over those uh, four values. But it ha doesn't have to be that. It can just be an irredu any irreducible representation of the group or, or any representation in general. Um, but let's say we use the irreducible representations of the group. Um, and, um, and so they can be finite dimensional, but you, know, you just throw away the higher frequencies You throw away the higher frequencies um, when you do that, but it, you know you can, for instance, if you look for SO3, you can have you know the L equals one, L equals three, L equals five. So those are the representations for SO3 for the different values of L, and they're all finite dimensional, but they are sort of the lowest frequencies, and then you know you build up the frequencies as you go up in L. Okay, so now we've established how our our feature fields uh, transform in a neural net. So F is a feature field of a neural net, like a, you know, activations in a, in a feature map. Um, so we have under some, you know, group transformation G, we know how, you know, F1 transforms, which is one layer. And then we know how F2 transforms, which is the layer, the next layer, right? And we also know how to get from F1 to F2, because that's just taking some convolution over a kernel, right? There is some kernel K here. Um, that you convolve the input feature map with, and then you get the output feature fx2. And that's, well, for groups, the most general thing you can do. And I think Rizzi just proved that in his paper, that that's basically the most general thing you can do. Um, okay, so then if you put these things together, right, you can write down an equation for that kernel. What should it satisfy in order to get equivariance, right? For the, you know, if, if you rotate the original imp input image, then, we need that all these feature maps rotate and transform under some you know, representation of that group, right? Um, 
And uh, so this is the, you know, the equation that you can write down. So it's basically the kernel at you know g x one comma x two. You can also write g x one minus x two because it's stationary. Um, that should transform like this. So on the right hand side, you take the representation of the first layer inverse, evaluate the g, and at the on the left hand side, you multiply by the representation of the second layer times k. So that's the fundamental equation of equivariance in some sense. Of course, you also need to think about the nonlinearities. Um, we already discussed that um, in, in Yuzi's talk. So you also need to have equivariant nonlinearities, but you can design them. Okay, so this is really important. And for those who are into sort of high energy physics, this really looks like the transformation law of a gauge field, an exponentiated gauge field so in, in the group, not in the, in the algebra. Right, so that, except for the fact that these live in two different spaces, and for a gauge field, they would live in the same space. That's actually not quite the gauge fields that I want to talk about. So um, steerable CNNs, um, so here we have, sorry. So, uh, so um, if you take an input and you rotate it, right, here's a scalar activation, here's a vector. Um, so the field, and you can see if you stabilize them, then in fact, you know, they're equivariant, they don't change. Okay, now I'm gonna quickly move to deep learning on manifolds. Um, so if you, you can imagine that you want to do deep learning on an actual uh, two-dimensional surface, which has rotate, which has um, uh, sort of curvature. Um, and we all know, and an interesting thing is that we all know that in general relativity, um, you know, masses curve the space, right? And you get like, you know, a sort of bending of light. And this was my thesis, which was about, you know, two di gravity in two dimensions, which basically boiled down to cutting out pieces out of the, here's a, here's a mass and you just cut out a little piece out of your space time and then you sort of glue these things together and that was all you needed to do to at least classical gravity. Um, and that, that thing is exactly what's happening interestingly um, for deep learning on a manifold. So in a Euclidean space, you know what to do in order to do a convolution because you take a kernel and you just know, you know, if you wanna share that kernel at any other position, you just know, you know, how you can just shift it there and it doesn't matter which path you take. Um, it will always be the same kernel when you move it there. Um, in other words, you know, um, you take a, you, you, you can just choose however you bring it there. This is one unique solution and then you can just share very nicely the values of that kernel. The problem is on a curve manifold, you get this annoying thing, which is called holonomy. If you take your, you know, your, your feature vector, let's say you defined it here, now you wanna say, okay, what does that mean if I want to use that here, right? If I transport that according to this curve, it's, it's this. And if I transport it according to this curve, it's like this. And so now it has a different orientation, right? So, and this has to do with the fact in two dimensions that there's these angle deficits. So if you, if you discretize it, you make these things flat and at these vertices there is a little angle deficit. And that means that if you move around, you know, one of these vertices, then um, you'll have a little, you know, angle cut out. And that basically means when you identify this go to, he in to here, then you rotate it a little bit, right? So what it means is that you can transport it, but you're always stuck with, in this case, a an, an, uh, two-dimensional orientation that you don't know. And, the and it's path dependent. The, the two-dimensional orientation is completely path dependent. And um, so that's the holonomy, and, you, and we need to sort of do something about that because we can't even define very well what the, um, um, you know, how to even define the convolution. Okay, so I'm gonna try to explain this in a very simple illustration. So uh, we now know how a black hole looks like. So let's put a black hole somewhere in the middle of, uh, of our space, right? This means that uh, space is like, is gonna curve like a cone. And let me cut out, you know, that here, like take the scissors and cut it open. And then the space looks like this. It's actually flat everywhere, but I have this, this identification issue here. So if I go from here to here, I take some filter like this, you know, I then tra or uh, from here to here, and then transport it there, you know, identify this point with this point, but I also have to rotate, you know, the filter map like that. Okay, so, um, and I've conveniently chosen the, the, the mass of the black hole such that this is ex exactly 90 degrees. This means that um, instead of having to deal with all the you know, elements of the rotation group, um, I can just take uh, four elements, which are, you know, four 90 degrees uh, rotations. 
Okay, so um, so then here the issue is right. If I you know if I'm going to define my convolution and I take this you know this particular filter here and I move it here, right? Then I get some result. But if I move it along this curve, I you know my in this identification it rotated and I get a very different result. But if you look at this picture, it's kind of weird, right? That I get like this this completely you know, I would get this very strange discontinuity. Here. Nothing is happening here. The signal is very smooth. Right? I shouldn't get a strange discontinuity happening here because somehow I didn't know how to move my, uh, my feature map. So I need to do something about this particular problem which is caused by this holonomy in this space. Cosmic streak, that's very good actually because it um, turns out that my, you know, so in, if you would take the third Lagrangian feature map and you would map it to a cosmic string, you can go back in time on a cosmic string. There's really interesting object. But um, yeah, so uh, in two dimensions, we can, uh, we can just imagine there's a black hole there. Um, okay, so how am I gonna deal with this annoying issue, right, that I don't know how to define my feature map? So the first thing is I'm gonna define some local charts. So this is exactly how things happen in general relativity. So I'm gonna, so this is, this is not part of my chart definition, it's just my cutting edge. So I'm gonna, so these three, you know, lines here are gonna be defining my chart, so there's one chart here, there's one chart here, and there's one chart here, and I'm gonna define a frame, basically, in which I'm gonna do my com computations. Um, I think this is fairly similar to what Rizzi was talking about, is saying, I label, you know, my first uh, neighbor one, my second neighbor two, my third neighbor three, so that's a pretty arbitrary choice of what to label your neighbors. You know, I'm gonna, define completely arbitrary frames of orientation in which I'm gonna do my computations um, here. Okay, then I have to actually define how I'm going to do at least locally my convolution. Um, and the idea is that, um, so you take a point P on your manifold and then um, you're gonna define some vector V and that's the, that's the argument of your kernel, right? So that's sort of uh, you know, X minus Y if you want in your kernel. And then I'm gonna take this exponential map, which basically takes you, take, shoots a geodesic at that point in that direction for one unit of time, and it arrives there. And that's where I'm gonna pick up the value of the signal on the manifold. But then I still have to transport it back here because there's a different frame in which I'm doing computations than there. So I have to first transport that vector back to P. Right, and the way I do that, you know, I know how it transforms because it has to transform under this you know, uh, representation row of the group. And, um, you know, it has to, it's, it's the transformation induced by parallel transport of that vector over this line. And so we indicate this with this, but it's an element of the representation of the group that I'm interested in. And if you do sort of lattice field theory, that's called the Wilson line. That's exactly parallel transport of a vector over, uh, over you know, from one lattice point to the next lattice point. Now that I have the vector that is living here defined here, now I can compare it with my kernel and I can take the inner product and that's how I define the, the inner product P. Okay. Um, seeing I'm just talking and no, nothing is happening, so I'm all going over time, I'm aware of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be almost done. So the third, the third uh, you know, thing I need to do is establish this equivariance. And I already know what the equation for equivariance is, right, I already had it you know, before, so if I take the argument and multiply by the group element G, right, then I will have to you know, satisfy this equation. Now again, this looks like a gauge field. Um, what you basically have to, is basically a set of linear equations on your kernel K, uh, one for every element G. You can solve that and you get a basis set of, uh, of, feature ma of, feat of filters. And here I just plotted them out. So basically this is going from a six dimensional you know, uh, feature space to another six dimensional feature space. So that's this one. So these are the ones that you can choose freely. And, um, and then you have to sort of order them in, in, a, in a certain way that's demanded by this equation uh, in order to, to keep equivariance. Um, this again is on a discretized six, we have discretized the rotation group over six, uh, six angles. But you can do it for irreducible representations as well, no problem. Okay, and then the final thing is, you know, um, sort of uh, instead of, you know, no, instead of just doing a convolution with one of these filters, you just do the convolution with all of the filters at once, right? And you have to just tell me in each chart, you know, how to 
transform the result from one chart to the next. So from here to here, you know, I actually changed the frame. And so I'm just going to have to tell you, okay, if these are my four feature fields, what's happening if I go from here to here to get the equivalent computation, right? In this case, it's very simple. It's like a cyclic permutation. So this one goes here and these ones go there. And that gives you then continuity across this line, right? Because now if you know how to transform, if you go from here to here, then there's continuity. And then from here to here, you can just take the identity map. And now everywhere locally, everything is smooth and continuous. Yet, if you make a full sort of turn, then you see this, this transformation, which is the holonomy. And that's something you cannot avoid because that's basically in the, in the um, sort of curvature of the space. But at least locally, you can make things look smooth, which is what you need. Okay, so, uh, so this is an example. We did spend some time trying to make things very computationally efficient. So we, instead of a sphere, we took like uh, this icosahedral um, object. Now I'm getting really out of time. And, um, and so you can clearly see at the edges here, you can nicely see the, um, the cut out angle. Um, you can turn, you know, you can unwrap this thing. You can cut it over these edges and unwrap it. Then it looks like this and you locally flatten it. Here you get this funny behavior, right? If you go here, it rotates. Um, you have this holonomy there. You know, then you cut them open and you glue them together and you can do one conf over this whole thing <coughs> and then later transform these feature fields according to this law and then actually dwell on it. And um, here's a bunch of applications that we did to just show that you can actually do this in practice. This is the earth and you're trying to model, uh, you segment out, let's say, storms or other weather patterns. Um, and here's like a, you know, an indoor scene, three-dimensional indoor scene and you want to sort of, you know, segment out objects there. It's basically a UNet if you know what that is, but then it needs active variance. So in, in conclusion then, um, so you can do uh, convolutional neural networks on manifolds naturally, but you have to introduce gauge fields basically, which is really cool I find. You cannot avoid it. It's just, and it's the same, it's exactly the same as going from uh, special relativity to general relativity. You get stuck with these holonomies and the solution to these holonomies are gauge fields and parallel transport. Um, and so you, you have to deal with that. It's and, and it's the same theory. Um, so we can do efficient implementations by making locally flat uh, charts. However, uh, right now we're working on on meshes and trying to make the computation efficient on meshes, like like here. Um, and I think there's actually this looks like very exotic, but there's actually a lot of really interesting applications. Uh, you can think of you know, earth sciences, anything that lives on a sphere, astronomy. Autonomous driving, where you have like lots of cameras looking at different directions. Uh, computer graphics, like you know, putting you know a texture or high resolution texture on on two-dimensional objects. You know, and and hopefully uh, also interesting physics. Thanks very much. I'm, so if I think of, so I can see how you can compute sort of objects on a fiber bundle or a vector bundle that is sort of nice. Are you imagining that different layers actually have features that live on different fiber bundles or it's the same thing or? Yeah, so, in, um, yeah, so I would say that the, the base space uh, should be the same, but the fibers should be different. They could ch change from one. Oh, I see. I see. But that's actually called the associated bundle. Well, I, you know, I would really love to talk about open questions, but I don't necessarily feel an expert on what open questions are in physics, except for one that I basically can steal from Kyle. He, he suggested it, uh, which is uh, generating um, lattice uh, sort of configurations on, uh, you know, of let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of lattice, lattice configurations on a, on a, on a lattice. So uh, take a, a gauge field, Maybe you should help me here. Uh, so uh, some kind of, uh, yeah, what do you? Questions where you think that there is some sort of like, you know, I mean, there, there are local gauge symmetries, but w one of the ideas we've been thinking about here is also if you can tie these convolutions also to the to the generative models and things like that. So if you're trying to look at this last data and you know it's there, you'd like to impose not just the translational symmetries, but potentially these gauge symmetries. 
And so, you know, people have either done gauge fixing, there were some papers that were doing uh, only the uh, invariant types of things, so they were losing the equivariants, so they were losing power when they didn't need to be. Uh, and then there are other approaches where people are trying to do data augmentation, but that scales horribly, right? So I think there are plenty of physics examples where you would like to do this. The, I think there, in some cases, it's a discrete. A lot of times it's going to be continuous. So uh, this, con this uh, the steerable thing as, um, is, I think, what the direction you would need to go if it's a continuous group. Yeah. And I personally also like a lot the um, sort of the combination of generative models or I explainable models where you know physicists would put in a lot of their prior knowledge with deep learning. And I would think of that as a forward model which has the sort of the expert knowledge and then you need to invert the, f the forward model um, and that could be done with a combination of you know inference and generative models plus Neural networks. Almost kind of undersells it a little bit because everything is a triangle and it's all the triangles of the same size. But this is in this is going to be. Uh, Covariant, even to reparameterizing like the metric, right? So that's great. But then uh, you pick up these more and more channels at each layer. So to compensate for that with the signal processing uh, philosophy, you would want to have a coarser and coarser mesh. That would also be very important for like multi grid simulations, that sort of thing. Right. But I think that is still like a fundamentally uh, uh, deep and open question of how to portion this sort of architecture. Okay, so yeah, so you could, I mean, we are currently working on keeping the mesh the same, but at least, you know, defining the convolutions on the mesh correctly and, and quickly. But it's a good idea to also, at the same time, you know, when, when once you are portioning anyway, you can also course the mesh itself. And doing that adaptively uh, would also be very interesting. Yeah. But that's not a physics-related problem, maybe, so I want to try to... Oh, I see. You solved it with heat flux, Where you are. And uh, maybe that's more natural, actually, because it handles the curvature, but you can understand a function along a path fairly globally and fix some of the coordinates. You mean like a diffusion on the, on the manifold? I didn't quite understand what you were saying. 